Hello everyone, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter, here to talk about what happened in February 2019 for paleontology. With the end of the government shutdown, a lot more papers were published, as more paleontologists could work. So let's get started. Bahadosaurus pronuspinax is a new species of sauropod coming from South America. It was closely related to Amariosaurus, which is known for the long spines sticking off of its neck vertebra. In Bahadosaurus, these spines were bent forward much further than in other closely related species, which led to the researchers suggesting that it may have been a method of defense, as the animal would be less prone to attacks from theropods on its neck with these spines. However, this idea has seen some controversy, as the rest of the animal would still be defenseless. Additionally, the spines may not have actually been bent this far forward in life and they may have just gotten somewhat distorted after millions of years in the rock. And that's going to take specific study of the rock formation and the matrix in which Bahadosaurus was found, and that kind of study hasn't happened just yet. Coming from the Gobi Desert of Mongolia, Gobi Raptor minutus was a very small species and new addition to the Oviraptorid family. The juvenile specimen is believed to be a unique genus, and this is because of the thicker jaw and beak that the oviraptorids were distinctly known for. However, it may have just been the juvenile of one of the larger, better known species, and the bill may have thinned out over the course of the animal's lifetime. However, the fact the bill was thicker does suggest that it was trying to capitalize on a different food source than the other oviraptorids, even potentially its older versions. And that shows just how diverse the oviraptorids were, with many different species and genera coming from the parts of the Gobi Desert that make up present-day Mongolia and China. In the more medical side of paleontology, there were two different papers this month that looked at bone diseases in different species. The first was a tumor, an example of bone cancer in a prehistoric turtle. This tumor that was found seems fairly identical to that which has been found much more recently and even today in living animals, and shows how cancer has always been a plague on life. The second was an early case of scoliosis, coming from an early mesosaur. A study of the bones of the animal showed that the scoliosis was present from birth, and the two papers together highlight how we need to continue to fund medical research so that we can try and address these issues as it's not something new, and it's likely to be something far into the future that we need to keep an eye on. Mnyangmawa Ntuka is a new genus of titanosaurian sauropod coming from Tanzania. Named in the native language of the region, Kiswahili, the genus represents one of the earliest known titanosaurian sauropods, and one that is notably not from Argentina. Well, not the largest of the titanosaurs, like Argentinosaurus, its position in Africa and as a very basal member of the titanosaurs can help shape our understandings of how the titanosaurs became so dominant across both continents. This kind of understanding of the titanosaurs is also helped by the fact that the specimen is relatively complete when compared to other titanosaurs, with a large number of the bones being found, including some of the tail vertebrae, which have a distinctive heart shape to them. Additionally, with the naming of the animal in the language native to the area it was found, just helps to highlight how paleontology is a global science, and how we need to become more inclusive in bringing more people together so that we can highlight these kinds of finds for their local communities. Ototus, or Carcharocles megalodon, is the largest shark to have ever lived, preying upon whales up until just a few million years ago. A recent paper looked at the fossils that could be most definitely defined in age, and found that Megalodon may have gone extinct a million years earlier than previously thought. It was initially believed that Megalodon had gone extinct at the end of the Pleistocene, with many of the other large vertebrates of the time. However, it now seems that it went extinct a million years before that, which coincides much more with the arrival of the Great White Shark in the world's oceans. While a fully grown megalodon was very much the apex predator of the oceans, that doesn't mean that the young didn't have to compete with the great whites. And it seems as though the great white eventually won out in that evolutionary battle, and became the much more dominant hunter of smaller mammals, such as seals, in the world's oceans. 
This competition prevented the Megalodon from reaching adulthood, which eventually led to their extinction. Often, the Tyrannosaurs are seen as less agile and more cumbersome than the other massive carnivores, such as Giganotosaurus or Carcharodontosaurus. That doesn't seem to be the case, though. By looking at the leg muscles in these different genera of dinosaurs, they found that the Tyrannosaurs are more apt to having larger muscle attachments on their legs. Specifically, these muscle attachments show that the Tyrannosaurs would be able to turn and pivot more quickly than the other large theropods. This could be part of the reason that the Tyrannosaurs became so dominant in North America after their arrival on the continent during the Cretaceous. In North America, Acrocanthosaurus was the largest theropod living on the continent before the arrival of the Tyrannosaurs, and after the arrival of the Tyrannosaurs, it and all of its relatives disappear from the fossil record, meaning that it's very likely that adaptations like this in the Tyrannosaurs, which let them move more rapidly, caused the extinction through competition of animals like Acrocanthosaurus. Not all of the Tyrannosaurs were incredibly large, though. Some, like the new species Moros intrepidus, were actually quite small, about the size of a deer. Moros intrepidus is a North American Tyrannosaur and fills in a large gap of missing time in the Tyrannosaur timeline on the continent, filling in about 15 million years before the other Tyrannosaurs seem to have become the dominant predators on the continent, with things like Lythronax living in the same place but many millions of years later. Its appearance in the fossil record shows that Tyrannosaurs were migrating to North America as early as 90 million years ago, only a few million years after the disappearance of Acrocanthosaurus in the fossil record, and only 10 million years before animals like Lythronax, a Tyrannosaur, became one of the more dominant predators on the continent. And now for my home state of Arizona, very early fossil frogs coming from the petrified forest in the northeastern part of the state. The deposits in this part of the state come from the Triassic period, and were very much on the equator 220 million years ago when they formed. These frog fossils aren't the oldest known frog fossils, but they are the oldest known fossils of a frog coming from a more equatorial environment, as this part of Arizona was very much on the equator when these rocks formed 220 million years ago. Generally, the more commonly found fossils from this region are things like temnospondyls, which are giant amphibians, and phytosaurs, which, while not crocodiles, filled a very similar niche as a large fish-eating reptile. The appearance of frogs in this environment shows that they were able to start spreading quite rapidly after the Permian extinction, and they had already filled a wide variety of niches after it. Additionally, there are frog fossils from the early Jurassic, a few million years after these new fossils were found. And that helps to show that these fossils that were there during the Jurassic weren't necessarily new additions from after the Triassic Jurassic extinction, but rather that the frogs survived that extinction and were able to succeed in this equatorial environment. Understanding how the frogs were able to survive the Triassic Jurassic extinction can help us understand what we need to do to address frog extinction today as many amphibian species, not just the frogs, are facing greatly reduced numbers due to climate change. When most people think of theropods, they think of the bipedal, upright dinosaurs that ate meat. And while that is accurate, they weren't always on two legs. At least some of the time, they would go down on all fours. New fossils from the Middle Jurassic of China show theropod tracks where at least for part of the time, it was crouched down and moving on all fours. It's still not known why the animal was down on all fours, and whether it was just trying to help drag itself through a tougher to get through area in the environment, or if it was trying to sneak up on a prey item. But the fact that they were down on all fours does help us understand at least a little bit more about what the kind of behavior we would expect to see from theropods and what we can try and predict about their behavior in the future as we find more fossil evidence of their trackways. Complex life may have started even earlier than previously thought, about 1.5 billion years earlier than thought. Soft-bodied animals don't necessarily fossilize very well, 
and so there's a lot of time missing in the fossil record from before the first complex life. In fact, most of the fossils we have from this time period are stromatolites, bacterial colonies that make small mounds even still to this day. The new fossils that indicate that complex life may have evolved over 2.1 billion years ago don't show the body or the form of whatever life form actually laid down the fossils. Rather, it's just tunnels that seem to have hardened and filled in with other minerals. The complexity of these tunnels indicates that there was likely something that was multicellular moving through the substrate of the time, trying to improve its chance for survival. This doesn't necessarily mean it was too complex, it was likely very much something similar to our present day amoebas. But the fact that complex life started 1.5 billion years earlier than previously thought does help to beg the question of what happened during those 1.5 billion years where we don't have fossils. Was whatever made this tunnel something that led to the animals we see today? Or was it a failed evolutionary experiment and something that went extinct with the complex life that led to what we see today evolving at another time period? Until we have more evidence from the rocks, it's going to be hard to say for sure. Dromaeosaurs like Deinonychus and Velociraptor are famous from the Northern Hemisphere, but less known are the Southern Dromaeosaurs, such as Ostroraptor. These Southern Dromaeosaurs were much different than their Northern relatives, having much thinner jaws and having slight differences in the build of the feet. While the Southern Dromaeosaurs did have the sickle claw that makes the raptor dinosaurs so iconic, they weren't built as powerfully for using that claw. Rather, the southern dromaeosaurs were built for long distance running more so than the northern dromaeosaurs were. This indicates that while the North American dromaeosaurs, like Deinonychus, may have been focused on hunting larger dinosaurs, such as some of the iguanodontians that lived during the same time period, the southern dromaeosaurs were more specialized for taking smaller prey. And this isn't just something that's based on the size of the dinosaur as some of the southern dromaeosaurs, like Ostroraptor, could reach the same sizes as the largest of the North American raptors, such as Utah Raptor. So this is a very deliberate specialization to avoid competition with another predator in the environment, and to specialize on taking this smaller prey. The end Cretaceous extinction that killed off the non-avian dinosaurs has been somewhat contentious. While the impact at Chicxulub has long been identifiable, as the main cause of the extinction, some have argued that the Deccan Traps, a series of massive volcanoes in India, also helped to cause climate change that made the dinosaurs start to stagnate and even die off before the impact finished the job. However, a new study looked at more of the timings of the volcanic eruptions in India. Using radiometric data, the scientists were able to more accurately define when the Deccan Traps were erupting and found that they were mostly erupting after or at the same time as the impact in the early Caribbean Sea. This means that the Deccan Traps didn't necessarily have that major of an impact on the dinosaur's extinction. Alternatively, the impact may have just shifted enough of the tectonics to help cause a reinvigoration of the eruptions at the Deccan Traps, meaning that the Deccan Traps weren't necessarily the cause of the extinction, but a symptom of the larger problem which was a rock the size of Mount Everest, hitting the planet at 50 kilometers a second. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. Sorry that this video got out so late. Uh, we're going through a lot of stuff right here at home right now, so we're trying to get some adjustments done so that we can get more organized for the next video so they can be a little bit more on time. So again, sorry, thanks still for watching. And remember, be safe, take care, don't go extinct.